One of the uh, methods of dream yoga is that, that once you realize you're dreaming and you're in a dream, then you meditate, so which you withdraw your, your attention from the dream and uh, uh, various techniques, but one, you can shut your eyes, for example, and, and uh, what happens next? And sometimes you stay asleep than in a state that is more like this emptiness. Now, the, the, the case that I described, the, the first one in the lab, it, it, uh, it was interesting and unusual, but it didn't have any, anything special uh, about it, as far as I was concerned. It didn't have a, a character of it's not a pure, yeah, it didn't have any properties. But it, didn't, it wasn't interesting nothingness. Whereas in other cases, for example, when I was pursuing a particular project of seeing what I can do with lucid dreaming in terms of understanding uh, my truest nature. Uh, I had experiences that were very much like that, which I could describe. And uh, it, it it's, uh, really started out with the uh, concept that uh, I first I had to go through a level of uh, personal integration of, of, of accepting any kind of uh, nightmarish shadow figure that I came across. So if there was somebody that uh, I wanted to get away from in my dream, uh, I had to go back and befriend them or accept them in some way rather than you know, avoid them and transcend, you know, fly away because that was just an avoidance idea. So I had to first work on the level of accepting what happened there. And if you don't do that, you have a problem that, uh, that Frederick van Aden, who uh, coined the term lucid dreaming back in 1910 or so, described having a series of lucid dreams in which sometimes he'd have these wonderful beatific dreams where he'd be floating in the clouds, feeling uh, blissful uh, uh, transcendence and angelic music, you know, the usual kind of thing, heavenly. Uh, but then he said, but I'd have these other dreams that would follow it frequently where I'd be followed around by devils who would be mocking my pretended holiness and my reaction to them, of course. Then, so I'd get a whip and get away from me, you damned beings. And just think about that. So what he's doing uh, is he's t taking these angels and by his negativity turning them into a piece of himself that he is disowning, which is exactly why they are mocking his pretended wholeness, right? Because he's not wholly whole, because he's not accepting all of, of reality somehow, especially that part of his humanity that he's disowned. And so the, he seemed to be stuck on that because his conclusion from those demonic dreams was that this is what first showed me that, that not everything that's in our dreams comes from our own minds. These were uh, astral entities of a lower moral order somehow. See, this, it's, 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 a, it's a very destructive idea that the kind of astral projection notion that these, these entities out there, they're trying to get you and you've got to get rid of them, protect yourself from them. No, it's you want to transform the demons into angels. They're, they're messengers as they were of wholeness. And if you accept them, they transform. And so you give them power when you say, someone I gotta get rid of. It's, it's like, it's the craziness of waking up from a nightmare when you realize it's a dream. Say, so, oh, it's just a dream. So let me just get out of here by waking up. Well, oh, why, if it's just a dream, do you have to get out of here? That's sort of disowning the process. It's not trusting the lucidity. As I showed a slide in the lecture about uh, one of these Gary Larson cartoons where uh, we, we, we see a dormitory, uh, you know, with flames and a fiery cavern, and uh, one guy says the next one, go back to sleep, Chuck. You're just having a nightmare. Of course, we are still in hell, right? And that's what it is to wake up from the dream, you know, to try to get away from some part. Uh, by waking up, you're just not seeing it, but it's still within you somehow. So to deal with it while you're there is the possibility that lucid dreaming offers. It says that's the time to connect and accept. And that when you do that, then that transformation occurs. So it's facing the shadow figures. And the shadow figures in the Jungian terminology is the idea that they're parts of our personality 
nationality that we've disowned because they were not rewarded by our parents, for example, and we were punished for certain behavior, so it was adapted to pretend not to be that way. Oh, it's somebody else that has that did it. it I'm not reward me. So we get a personality, that persona, an appearance that includes the good stuff and not the bad stuff. So we get parts of our being that we've cut ourselves off from, the rest of humanity. So the idea of inclusion, of reintegration, of bringing it all together into a unity, you know, a non-dualistic oneness, that's a possibility of lucid dreams, a very direct way. And that, that was what my own personal path with lucid dreaming has been. And over the years, uh, worked through those uh, and went from having frequent nightmares where I was getting away from the police, the underworld, the angry mob, you know, them, undesirables of all sorts, and finally, you know, learned to accept whatever it was that came along as it may be an unpleasant appearance, but I still need to accept it like that hideous giant insect in the other Gary Larson cartoon I showed on the doorstep, you know, uh, maybe it's a hideous giant insect in need of help, right? And so it could be, of course, uh, Franz Kafka's uh, Gregor Samsa, you know, who has turned into the insect and nobody uh, can see him from other than a horrible monster. Well, the horrible monsters need love too. And so that, that sense uh, of a kind of a spiritual element in lucid dream is one of the possibilities I think that's very uh, available to uh, anyone that has lucid dreams. And it, it's um, dream yoga usually doesn't deal with that very much. And I think it's because dream yoga is an advanced practice in the Buddhist system that is already very strongly compassion based and and the ethical dimension and the acceptance of all sentient beings is something you're already doing. So they're not going to have to work through that level first. But if not, I'd say it's sort of a requirement. Once you've got that, then the next step is to say, all right, if in a lucid dream, I, as Stephen, suppose, will say, realizes he's dreaming right now. So what does that mean? If he's got only a little lucidity, he says, I'm dreaming. You're in my dream, for example. Okay, well, but that doesn't really make sense because if this is a dream, yes, you are a dream figure and this is a dream floor, dream Zaya, dream shirt, right? What else would it be? Dream arm, dream Stephen, dream body. This who I thought I was a moment ago has to be a dream, an idea, not who I am assuming that the I am is what I am. It, but this is not it. This is just a dream. So now I open up to what else is there? How can I experience in this dream something closer to my essential nature? And that then comes, you know, you got to open yourself to guidance, to the possibility to say, how can I experiences because you don't it's not something you make happen or do but it's an openness a letting happen and for me i had a very powerful experience that uh, is you know, sort of a roundabout answer to your question and uh, this came from uh, started out at a wake initiated lucid dream where you go directly into the dream state from the waking state and i found myself driving in a little sports car down a beautiful spring roadside and it's sort of like where i lived at the time this so there was a Stanford golf course it seemed like and it was a, a wonderful feeling of vivid presence and a beautiful day and I see down by the side of the road in front of me an attractive hitchhiker and and I have the thought that hmm maybe I might stop and pick her up and that would be no that's a dream I've already had I want this dream to be an expression of the highest potential whatever that potential is at which, that little bit of resignation, that renunciation, the car started to fly into the air. And as it flies upward into the clouds, the car has disappeared. I'm flying through the clouds where there are symbols of traditional religions. So Star of David and the steeple and cross on it and, and these different images of religion. And then I fly further. My body f falls away just as the vehicle of the car has gone now, but I'm a point of awareness going beyond the clouds and I enter into a, a vast emptiness, a space, a void that surprisingly 
is filled with love. It's homecoming. It's recognition that this is the source of being. It's here, always has been, and I'd forgotten about it. And I am overwhelmed with a blissful experience, of, and I start singing songs of praise, just you know, Gaudate, and, uh, and that resonates with a uh, you know, vast space and just feels a perfect expression of what it is to be. And I wake up from that dream and say, wow, that seemed to be an answer to my request for a while. Experience of the highest potential, but what did it mean? Because the, the the words I was saying up in that space there, they didn't quite mean anything anymore because there wasn't an I. I was saying what it amounts to I praise thee, O Lord, but there was no Lord, there was no I. There was praise, perhaps, but there wasn't this duality. It was just this you know, oneness of being and return and remembrance and this homecoming feel. And from that experience, when I then reflected on, on the meaning of it, so what, what did I learn from that? Because I never would have guessed that an empty space would feel that full. And this is a plenum. And uh, I, I realized that it was an answer to the, 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 the challenge that I was having of understanding how I could both be so apparently an individual, and Stephen, distinct from Zion, you know, distinct from Nick, wherever he may be. And yet, there's another being, right? This, this oneness. And, and it, it seemed that a, a metaphorical way of understanding that was, here I was, a, a particular snowflake. And each snowflake, you know, is designed, you know, is different. It has a different crystalline form and every one is unique. So they say each one you look at is different from the others. So they're different. They really are different. They're not the same. But what happens to us at death? Here we are, a snowflake falling into the sea of death. And we say, ah, I'm going to be annihilated. I'm going to, my being is just going to be dissolved. That's it, the end. And once we hit the water, though, we experience an infinite expansion of being as we remember that we weren't just this one particular droplet of frozen water in that form we're identifying with, but water, the sea. And it sudden it just became plain, of course. It's in the metaphor, the substance of we that we share, and that's the one that that's there. The other thing, People can say it's an illusion, it's unreal. Sure, but it's got a biological reality and that's what we're most attuned to in these conditions of our life. So we, I think, shouldn't dismiss it and say it really is nothing, Go, it's just an illusion. Yes, it's, it's an illusion to think that that's all you are, is that you're only this form instead of your wider being that you've forgotten about. So, it's a relative point of saying, yeah, maybe it's better to think that the individual you think you are is nothing than to uh, forget the real being, the eternal being that we all share. So, so that was like the once I where when I went to that potential, it's the same kind of state that people report experiencing in the um, uh, well, the call it the aware, non-dreaming state. 